Hi, good day everyone. Welcome to this um, lecture um, on Unit 2. Um, I'm just going to run through Unit 2 because we've done dealt with most of the work in, um, in the uh, lecture on, on Monday. So I'm just going to briefly touch on certain items and then I'm going to focus on the concepts that we didn't get to um, during the lecture. So um, I'm going to run through Unit 2, as me mentioned, pro the bro project life cycle, and then we're going to start looking at some um, some concepts when doing cost estimation. So we're going to look at applying uh, the project life cycle um, production um, of information, we'll understand the basics of cost estimation, and then allocate the different cost um, estimations to your project life cycle. So the concepts that we're going to, to look at uh, in the second section of this lecture is going to be very important for your assignment. When, whenever you build up your rate and you make some assumptions, you're going to take uh, these concepts into consideration. So firstly, looking at chapter one, the basic principles of cost um, planning and cost control. So I would expect you to actually have a look and go through your study notes uh, for more detail. So this lecture is more just highlights some of the important items that's in there. So it's a bit of a um, almost like a summary of what's contained in the study notes. OK, so cost design ratio. So there's always a cost design ratio that one needs to look at. Your design is not an easy task and uh, skill and knowledge information and time is needed. So it's it's you need experience whenever doing a proper um, estimation. The success of the um, of a project is not necessarily um, dependent on whether you uh, have, do it successfully, but it um, go goes hand in hand with actually the experience, the satisfaction that the that you enjoy and the client enjoys on the project. Compared to traditional um, scientific model for problem solving. This is um, the concept that I explained on um, whenever you do an uh, estimate on a project, it's always a hypothesis until it's done. And you can actually um, compare what the uh, hypothesized cost would be uh, in relation to what it actually worked out on. And then the design observes the need of the des um, developer. Hypothesis is formulated and tested on the basis to find the optimum solution. And the historical data is used. So you always use data on which you base your um, estimate. It's never um, just something that you um, do a thumb suck on. It's uh, based on real information that you had on previous projects. And then a hypothesis can however not be tested timelessly, um, although with um, the advent of BIM and modeling, you can actually get, um, you can uh, test your hypothesis um, a little bit more than uh, we could in the olden days. It's always dependent, or all the, um, it's also dependent on um, whether the rates that you use for your es estimate is correct or not. Okay, and time and cost is limited. So you can't continually test and go back to the drawing board. At some stage, this um, project has to come to light so that the a developer can actually make money out of it or stay or utilize the, uh, the building also. Okay, then remember I showed the spaghetti challenge. Uh, so I just um, put in the link here so you can copy and paste that into your uh, browser so that you can have a look at it. Then the cost design ratio. Cost is most important single factor directly influencing the design. So unfortunately we have this uh, constraint usually on our projects that there's not enough money. Sometimes you do get um, nice projects where uh, the client um, doesn't really care about the cost too much. Obviously um, he wants good value for money but um, uh, on most projects, um, cost is usually a big constraint. Cost design ratio is influenced by the cost, which is depend or independent. Uh, it's independent because the client um, knows or he has the funds. The size uh, of the project is 
independent and also dependent on the cost. The shape, same thing, also dependent or independent and dependent on the cost. And then you've got your specifications is in the, um, independent and dependent on uh, the cost. So there's a, a big ratio between that, although it leans towards the uh, mostly dependent on how much funds is available. But if you play around with the size, the shape and the specifications, you, you can usually find a middle ground. And this is where the cost engineers uh, come comes in their own uh, or the QSs uh, with feedback on uh, what options would um, be best. Okay, so the main thing, like I said, is finding the balance. Then your design process. Usually you have your analysis, your synthesis and your evaluation. So you've got your analysis of what the need is. You try and make it uh, material and then you evaluate it. Will this actually fit within the budget? The real design, design decision is made in the uh, first two uh, phases of the project. Um, and uh, research has shown that 80% of the cost of the building is usually made up in um, these two phases. Only 20% uh, can be controlled in the last, last third of the project. Okay, so this is a good example, um, the size and shape of the project. So this is similar um, projects uh, of size um, or areas uh, per square meter, although um, the Apple campus had a few advantages. It had a lot of land to work on, so it didn't have, um, it didn't need a, a, a large um, project to, um, or footing actually to, uh, to accommodate the, um, the building. So um, just for interest sake, um, with the, the Apple campus, um, with all the tech and so on, one would actually think that the Apple campus uh, would be more um, or uh, less expensive. Um, although with the tech, um, it, um, it worked out uh, quite a bit more because it was a larger um, construction. It worked out at about 853,000 square meters and it worked out at uh, 5,858 oh, dollars per square meter, whereas the Burj Khalifa actually worked out at um, a cheaper rate. It only covered um, 309,000 uh, square meters, but it came in at 4,846 uh, 4, square meter, or, um, dollars per square meter um, because it, um, it looked at the facades and the, the installation. Um, it didn't require that much uh, tech uh, and it was built over a much shorter period, which saved a bit of money. So one would have expected that the um, Apple campus would be, um, would be um, cheaper than the Burj Khalifa, but then the uh, Burj Khalifa actually worked out uh, cheaper in this case. Okay, so looking at cost planning um, concluded um, and the conclusion of this section. Cost information is thus essential for the first two phases. Traditionally though, cost is only really looked at um, phase three. It, it's um, usually dependent on the emphasis from, from the client or the QS or the project manager on how the cost is looked at. Um, at the beginning of the project. Usually good project uh, or um, developers <coughs> do um, focus a lot on the cost on stage one and two because they want to make that informed decision whether they're going to commit to this project. So usually when you get to stage three, you, you're already committed to this project because now you're spending a lot on fees um, for this project. So you um, the money starts flowing um, a little bit more so there's much more commitment. So the compilation of the cost information during the uh, first two phases is referred to as cost planning. And then uh, the systems approach, um, this is in short, you can go through this, please read through the study notes. This is basically where you've got the input um, of um, 
you've got your input, your processes and your output. And with us, um, the stages one to two, each um, phase, the output of the one phase is the input to the next. Um, and whereas at the end of stage six, that output is usually the input for your stage one of your new project. Okay, systems approach, <clears throat> cost planning, cost control. So I'm just going to go through these um, quickly. You've got your open systems um, or your closed systems, your, uh, where your controls and um, changes um, and changes performance automatically by reacting to the information produced by itself. So it's basically um, the cost um, is influenced by the design of the um, building. It, it dictates what type of finishes they uh, can be or the uh, type of finishes dictate what the cost would be. The size of the building will dictate the cost of the building, the location, etc., etc. Whereas open systems doesn't make provision for its own control. So usually when you start um, just this, um, doing your cost um, estimation or um, planning in phase three, it means that it, um, no proper cost information was generated in, um, in the first two phases. And then you basically start with an open blank uh, way of looking at items. So your open systems doesn't make provision for internal control. Uh, it is um, usually w when you've got a, a client who's got a lot of money who doesn't really care, it's a bit more open than um, you're not constantly trying to look at the cost. You just do the design and you do the cost and uh, you continue with that. You don't go back to the drawing board and see if you can improve the design to bring down the costs. So system serves the following functions. It's got uh, identified input, the predecessor, what is the purpose, uh, maintains uh, real, uh, re reliability and val validity. Um, is this information tangible? Um, because for instance, the information that you use, you cannot use Cape Town rates, for instance, in Bloemfontein because the going rate is different. Um, and the materials, uh, material cost would be different, etc., etc. Okay, and then usually it rectifies malperformance. So uh, it's maybe a, uh, not the correct word, but it rectifies the design to actually um, to get into the the, um, the correct correct per parameters. Okay, and it identifies the users, the set objectives, and the limitations. Then your cost planning and control systems. You've got your cost planning, cost control can be seen as a closed system. Uh, the weak, um, oh, and I've got uh, the double E again. Uh, this week we looked at the architectural outputs in our systems of cost planning, cost control. So we just uh, basically touched on or discussed um, that the design um, does influence the cost. So that's a little bit, um, um, towards the end of this lecture. Okay, and then we've got our um, architectural guide on or cosette um, that I'm just going to run through, which is basically our six stages. So we've, remember, we've got our um, general project plan and we've got our six stages up to um, our closeout. And then each um, stage has its different outputs uh, from the architectural side. And all of this information influences what the QS can do. Same with stage two. We have a, um, a basic design or your concept design where that is done. And stage three is where you actually start developing your uh, design. What type of finishes are you, um, are you going to use? It's basically just finalizing the design and putting it on, start starting to put it on paper. Then you've got your documentation procurement. This is where you prepare your documentation required for local authorities for submission. And then you start developing your construction drawings um, for your contractor. Your, uh, and then the tender is called. And then stage six or oh, five, sorry, is where you've got your contract. You've got information that's um, detailed drawings, for instance, are how a flashing should be fitted um, to uh, the rafters, etc. 
um, how should the skirting be fixed to um, the walls that type of finishing is uh, then conveyed to the contractor then you've got your closeout where you facilitate the project closeout including the preparation of the necessary documentation to effect completion and over and operation of the con uh, of the project so that's your closeout report etc so the contractor's obligation with respect to the building contract has been fulfilled and the architectural professional shall issue the certificate related to the contract completion completion certificate qs is usually the final account Provide the client with as well drawings, this is for the architects, and relevant technical contractual undertaking by the contractor. Usually it's like a occupation certificate that's issued, depending on what type of project you're busy with. If it's a um, public um, project for government, you would have a occupation certificate, uh, like for instance your health and safety um, or your health um, inspector will in come and inspect your building. Um, they will ask is this the, the structural engineer sign off and all the SABS uh, documentation the um, is the electrical COC in place etc etc cost planning cost control subsystems the element of cost planning cost control are in the interdependent and continuously attract uh, each other the other um, this is a little bit over um, simplif uh, simplification of the situation though so then I just highlighted here how thinking non-linear uh, in process um, you can just go through this this is not too important um, but basically you've got your emphasis you um, define um, ideate and prototype and test so basically you've got your um, concept you've got your definition you've got your identification which is your design process and then you've got your prototype your working drawings or your model these days and then you test it and that information is then fed back into the items but like I said this is not too important you can go through this this will just explain subsystems a little bit more Okay, cost planning, cost control, subsystems. Okay, very important to go through. Um, cost planning, cost control systems consist mainly out of three subsystems. You've got your output of the one serves as the input of the other. So you've got your assignment stage. Um, you establish the scope, basically. You look at the scope and you do your design and you pretend the activities. You look at your cost goals, produce from sketch plans, uh, or the design which serves as a basis for detail for the detailed plan of cost planning obviously the same with your design uh, you've got your um, concept designs or sketch plans which later is developed into your actual de detailed uh, plan and then you can have your post end activities which is your uh, cost plan development for detailed drawing service serves as an implementation for the next phase or the new project or so each system regulates each, um, regulates the next okay we've touched on that and then the cost planning and uh, uh, cost control or self-regulating uh, in fulfillment of the cost goal so it's basically a bit of a repetition of what we've what I've said uh, earlier on already Okay, and then I just added this um, little slide that you can have a look at. And then we get to chapter two, estimates of buildings. So this is where we actually um, get to what type of estimation um, methods is used. The goal is to obtain a prediction of the proposed building where detailed information is lacking or where it is, uh, is expensive, um, tedious or time consuming paying for the process. So you want to get the most optimal solution for that current situation where you are. Uh, it doesn't help that you try and comp uh, compile a bull, uh, bulls of quantities when you only at stage two or three, because there's still a lot of things that can change. So you don't want to spend too much and pay the, the QS too much fees uh, during this stage uh, of the game. So usually estimation is the best solution that can be used. 
the investor has to evaluate the financial plan. This is what I said earlier that after stage two, usually they assess whether they're going to go continue with this project or not. Funding has to be used optimally to ensure to select the most economical design solution. Funding is distributed economically over the project and costs are spent within the limits of the approved budget. The aim of the budget is thus to give cost involved and serves as basis on which the cost planning and control is done. Okay, and then you can go through page uh, 32 for some additional information. Okay, cost, uh, the basics of cost estimation. So it's the process of um, awarding um, monetary value values. I think this is probably awarding. Okay, awarding monetary values to certain uh, products and services to try and estimate what the total cost is. Now, there's always um, additional costs that, um, that the client has to be aware of, like for instance, the fees, VAT, uh, that has to be added, external works, um, um, payments of loans, etc. Usually, the payments of loans, we're not too involved in that is for the client. Um, but there's like uh, establishment costs, connection fees to the municipality, um, etc., etc. An estimate has uh, has to be uh, done quickly. Immediate pro uh, problem solving is needed, and it should be reliable. The estimates is a big um, risk on a project. One um, has to um, sit down and. Um, look at all the possible influences on the project. The cost estimator should apply knowledge, experience and discipline. I should further um, have a valid knowledge of composition of building. Basically, it just needs to understand that if you um, take out this wall, it might not necessarily save money because now you suddenly have to put in structural reinforcing in the ceiling to open up the space. So um, that, that's the basics that the cost estimator has to um, look at. He has to know what the influence of the one um, pro or professional is on the other. Um, so for instance, a, like I just mentioned, if the structural engineer changes something on this side, it may influence the look and feel of the architectural side as well. Where will the electrical ducting go? Will it fit within this um, uh, flat roof design? Is there enough space? Air conditioning ducting is usually a big challenge. Um, does the services clash with each other? That's the things that he has to look at. Thus, rates and quantities. You have your rates and you have your quantities. Those are the two parameters um, that influence the cost. So. If you want to bring down costs, you can either reduce the rates through the specifications or so, or you can reduce the quantities by altering the size of the project uh, or the design shape of the project or the design. Again, you can have a look on page 32. Okay, then you've got your design process. The accuracy of the estimate is determined by the stability of the market. Uh, the time of the estimate, uh, estimated training, knowledge and experience. Ac accuracy of information is very important. Um, if you select a certain type of tile, for instance, porcelain um, in comparison to ceramic, it will have a big influence on cost. Estimate the un understanding a uh, building cost. Uh, just on the information here is a simple thing which which I experienced once is um, where the architect wanted a stainless steel expansion joint within the tiles uh, and not a PVC one and then the cost um, per meter um, difference was quite big um, the um, PVC or the plastic expansion joint um, had a cost of about 20 rand, 25 rand per, per meter, whereas the stainless steel expansion joint with a um, rubber, um, in, rubber um, full filling in between was almost 150 rand per square meter. So um, that um, 
that was quite a, a big um, cost implication that we had there. So we actually saved a lot of money um, because of the tiling area was such a large area. We could re um, uh, rather put in the PVC um, expansion joint instead of the stainless steel one. Um, and we still um, got the same look and feel by just um, looking at the color of the PVC one that we put in. So um, that is options that one can actually look at um, on the on when you do your um, estimation and so on. Then ability to applying methods and estimation. Completeness of information. Is everything included? Is there not maybe a um, on, on the drawings a uh, footing that's not, maybe not shown or a external building housing, some mechanical in, um, insulation that's not shown on this drawing but it's shown on another drawing uh, which may not have been supplied to the QS, that, that type of thing. The completeness of information is very important. It, does it meet all the client's requirements? Um, that also happens quite a bit where the client comes back later on but they actually wanted this also in, in the design. Then the number of variations, how many variations is there um, on the project? Important decisions are made from the initial cost estimate. Yeah, like I mentioned. Okay, then we've got our methods of uh, measurement. So I've looked at this, as, uh, this is straightforward. Remember, we've got nine different estimation methods. We've got our single price methods. We've got our single price detailed methods and we've got our detailed methods. So each one has three estimation methods that we're going to look at. There's more estimation methods, although uh, we only included the nine most commonly used ones. So um, very easy to, to remember whenever you answer a question and you have to look at all of them, remember they um, divided into three categories and there's three underneath each category. So our single price methods, so we use our historical data always. So they are limited and um, entail the allocation of single tariffs. So it's usually a um, measurement times a rate. So for instance, you've got our unit method, which is the number of beds, the number of keys for a hotel development, um, etc. So you've got the number of beds times the rate of um, per unit when, when you use your historical building. Then you've got your area method, the one com most commonly used. You work out the area, you times that area with a rate per square meter. Then you've got your cube method, which is basically the same. You take your cube rate from a historical building and you apply it to the new cube interior that you actually use. Applying experience is very important. Okay, so this is um, for your task one that I'm going to look at. You need to tweak your your rights to for the situation. Then we've got our single price detailed methods. So we've got our store enclosure method, our para, uh, parametric system or method, and then we've got our elemental analysis method. Um, so we, uh, the elemental, uh, the analysis method is just um, the higher end of um, estimation. But you will um, understand that as soon as we get into the actual um, examples of those. So this is a, a example of a elemental analysis method where you've got your primary elements and so on. And you've got your cost estimation here, but it's based on a per square meter um, area on this side, which is times with a rate to get to that estimation. You will see you've got your alteration works and your external uh, um, services also here on uh, as extra items. Preliminaries, we'll still get to that. That's basically the contractor's establishment costs and our construction contingencies. Contingencies we'll also talk about, it's very important to note, um, that is usually at this stage of the project, 
there's still a lot of unforeseen design items that we haven't looked at. So we usually build in a bit of a contingency to make sure that, that we're covered for that. As the information gets more and more, you can actually lower the percentage of your contingencies. Then you've got your single price detailed methods. Uh, this is what we've uh, looked. So the accuracy of the unit rate can also be increased by using more detail um, of the historic building to derive the rate. So this is an example that I included or discussed in, in class is where you had a, a previous development that had certain elements towards a new development. So we had a new squash court that was being developed, but it had um, there's no single item that could be used the same. Like for instance, you had a gym with wooden flooring and your squash court also had wooden flooring. So you could use the rate uh, per square meter rate for your wooden flooring and apply it to here. But it had a concrete roof, which you couldn't apply to your um, new building. So you took this section and the IBR area or the construction of the build um, of this roof and applied it to the installation here. Although um, you can see that this was more a double pitch or a gable type, um, end type of construction, which doesn't really work out the same as this new development. So um, what I would have done is I would have lowered the rate slightly to accommodate for this. So then you can take that information and use it like that. But this example, there's a proper example of this that we're going to look at as well. So this is the story enclosure method uh, that we usually use. Okay, so what happened here is you take out the items which is applicable uh, to the project. You look at what the, um, the rate per square meter is and the exterior brick walls you use, you can see that's the same. You didn't have interior brick walls, so you could um, leave that out. Same with your concrete slabs, you didn't use that. Your waterproofing was also not included. And um, then what you do is you take all of these items, the rand per square meter, and you estimate what your new um, rate per square meter would be. You times it with your new buildings um, area. Then you put add your ex, uh, exterior work and then you add some special items like for instance this new building had extractor fans so you have to allow for that which was not included in the previous building so you need to evaluate your buildings according to that then you can see that p's and g's of eight percent was ad added um, and then a contingency to that and that as well to get to a new estimated cost of this building so this is the process uh, although don't break yourself exact, uh, on it to understand everything now exactly, just understand that, the, you, for instance, your external works is um, calculated separately and special items also calculated um, separately. Single price detailed methods, um, different BLQs, items is used. So you usually use your um, BLQ from a previous project um, to get certain rates uh, for your new project. Take more time than standard single price methods. Okay, and this is just basically the difference between your single price methods and your single price detailed method. More information is available. Okay, so this is... Um, then we get to our detailed methods. Our detailed methods, this is where most of the information is already available. Now you can actually in detail work out what your square meter floor area would be for your tiling, for instance. You, your skirtings, you can measure all of your skirtings, etc. And it, again, it's divided into um, three different methods. So we've got our elemental analysis method, but it goes up to component level. And then you've got your comprehensive quantities. And then you've got your accurate quantities as well. 
So you can see uh, your elemental estimation is now broken down. So you, here you've got your element, uh, primary elements divided into all of these items here. And you can see it's this is just a summary. So you can calculate your uh, total cost, your area of your building, and then you just calculated what your um, rate per square meter is um, based on your elements that you measured. So scrolling down further, this is um, now for in, uh, your substructure is divided into more detail and you can see now it's measured in different units um, per meter, per square meter, per cube. Uh, you add some percentages for items that you don't really know like hard rock, soft rock, etc. Then you get your floor construction, structural frame, etc. Okay, so not too important to know all of these um, differences just yet. Then our bills of quantities. Uh, very important to note is that we've got bills of quantities. So our bills of quantities comprises out of many bills divided into trades. So now you've got your trades of um, earthworks, your trade of masonry roof construct um, carpentry which includes your roof construction um, to, except if it's steel construction then it will um, um, fall underneath structural steel uh, for instance so this, the subcontractor would be a steel worker so if you think about your um, trades it's the tradesman that actually um, installs those items so roof coverings you will have uh, specialist roof uh, covering insta installers and does all of the um, roof sheeting, um, insulation, your gutters and everything like that will be included in this bill. Okay, very important to note, your bills of quantity, quantities always has an item number so that you can easily reference it. Your description is very important because this becomes a contractual agreement. How are you going to pay the contractor if he says he didn't price for a clip lock heavy duty industrial galvanized roof sheet? You can go refer back to the document and say, but here it was shown specifically that he has to price for it. So he can't go back. The rate that he provided here is fixed. He cannot change. We cannot change that. Um, that right. The quantities is usually also uh, provisional depending um, some contracts you may have fixed um, quantities so it doesn't matter whether um, it, it, um, it can only change by a variation not by re-measurement. Okay, and then you've got your quantity um, column where everything is measured. You've got your rate um, for that item, the installation, which includes the profit, um, overheads, etc. And then um, the total cost is estimated. And then all of these rates are added up to get to the contract sum. Okay, then you can go through the uniform rules. I'm not going to go through all of them, um, but it basically is whenever you do the uh, measurement, you need to uh, go through all of these steps to ensure that you have all the information and, and that it's done uh, correctly. Okay, and then I just included this typical question. You can have a look on the um, on the slides um, PDF. Um, uh, to look at it, but um, but this is a typical question that I might ask um, in a test or in the exam. Okay, and then we get to shape um, that um, explanation of the shape of the building and the size of the building and so on. But I'm just going to stop this lecture here. I see um, it's um, becoming quite a large file, so I'm just going to stop it here for now and then make a separate recording for the second section of the um, lecture.